Hi, and welcome to episode 15 of Metastatic Modernity. I'm Tom Murphy, and in this episode, we'll ask how we might react to the cancer diagnosis discussed in the last episode. This one turned out to be a bit of a long one, but it's an important inflection point on our journey to put modernity into context. So the bad news is that modernity is terminal. It's like a cancer. It's a glitch in the program. And this is because it's not based on principles of ecological sustainability. But you might say everything is terminal. I mean, our lives end, the sun will evaporate the oceans in about a billion years. The universe itself runs out of juice to make stars, fades out. So everything ends. But it's the time scale here that's really shocking. I mean, a species tends to last something like a million years, give or take a few orders of magnitude. Uh, modernity is just 10,000 years old. It's just a baby um, at most. Um, and it's kind of like giving a 20-year-old uh, one month diagnosis and, and prognosis for, for living um, is a bit of a shock. So modernity will not likely go away painlessly. Like a metastatic cancer, it's pervasive. It's deeply woven into the fabric of human life. So it's compulsory failure is bound to involve some pain and suffering. I like to compare it to having a wolf by the ear. You know, it's, you can't, let go of the ear or the wolf will, wolf will attack you. You can't hold on forever. So it's just an unfortunate situation. How did you ever get yourself into this? There's no easy escape. So people confronting these things might go through, understandably, five stages of grief, including denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Now, I've probably been through all of these, not maybe very long in the first two, and, you know, why are we going through this here? I mean, after all, it's a process that can take time, years, or even a lifetime. There are no shortcuts. You can't rush somebody through this. But maybe this can offer a bit of a roadmap for, for journeys. Okay, so denial. You might hear things like, you know, this can't be true. I mean, look around us. Things have never been better. You've got Moore's Law of Computing, high literacy, advanced medicine. We have smartphones. AI might solve our problems, we'll colonize Mars, the human mind has infinite potential, we're just starting to unlock the secrets of the universe, maybe even immortality. And I could go on, I mean, we swim neck deep in this thick cultural mythology all the time, every day. Uh, but to me, it represents a bit of tunnel vision, ignoring ecological reality. Okay, so anger, and in full disclosure, this is a picture of a yawning chimp. It's actually surprisingly hard to find a picture of an angry chimp, which might be its own sort of lesson. But anyway, if somebody still has a foot in denial, the anger might tend to be directed at the messenger, often laced with a bit of personal attack. Otherwise, the response might be, you know, how could they let this happen? Why didn't my news sources alert me? Whose fault is this? Those damn liberals, those damn conservatives, what have they conserved for us lately? I thought smart people were at the helm. How could so many people be so wrong? And this anger is justified. Uh, what can I say? Um, now, bargaining is a place where a lot of people get a bit stuck, you know, maybe finding comfort and hope in what I would call poorly evaluated schemes that are made possible by ecological ignorance. You know, why don't we just switch to solar? Why don't we recycle everything? You know, maybe we can buy and invent our way out of this. Or if you're a bit closer to acceptance, maybe we could go back to 19 or 1850s lifestyle. It wasn't so bad. You know, maybe what if I do meatless Mondays? And all these kind of deals, I think, avoid confronting a deeper truth. Now, if recognizing the pointlessness of denial and anger and the emptiness of bargaining, we might imagine sinking into depression and think things like all is lost, we're doomed, what's the point of going on, it's all been for nothing, my dreams are dashed. And I somewhat suspect that the fear and avoidance of this kind of phase of depression might be what keeps a lot of people stuck in the bargaining phase, because from that point of view, either you keep bargaining or accept defeat. Um, and maybe you won't know part of that kind of resulting depression or doomerism. And that's perfectly understandable. Now, beyond depression is acceptance that it could not be any other way. Um, all is not lost. You've got lots of good things outside modernity. And the problem is believing that modernity was the point, that it was the correct dream, or that it was modernity that brought meaning to the world. Maybe now see that that's a narrow and misguided framing, that we can find awe and wonder and amazement 
and gratitude and laughter and meaning, and love and community in other ways. So there's a glimmer of good news here that modernity is not the same thing as humanity. And we, we tend to conflate these two things because, you know, we think of modernity as a crowning achievement of humanity and allow it to define us. But modernity is not intrinsic to humanity. It's not in our DNA. And we know this because the vast majority of the time that humans have been on this planet have not been in the mode of modernity. We also know that modernity is temporary. It will end. Now, luckily, Homo sapiens is not biophysically dependent on modernity. So what it is biophysically dependent on is ecological health. And modernity's removal, we would hope, would leave some of that healthy tissue. So the modernity module is removable. I mean, it's an artificial layer that humans introduced recently. By artificial here, I mean it's not vetted by evolution, not integrated into reciprocal ecological relationships, still very new and experimental. And if we recognize the futility and destructive nature of modernity, we can stomp it out through vigilance and a reluctance to engage in cancerous behaviors. Many indigenous cultures rejected modernity, and it's not because they were dumb savages or similarly ignorant, insulting, offensive biases, but it was via explicit wise practices to deliberately suppress related behaviors like narcissism, power concentration, possessions, overtaxing, local ecologies. And they devised conventions like meat shaming and community ownership, the honorable harvest, and stories that emphasize humility and gratitude. The indigenous folks who the Europeans came in contact often were alarmed by things like property rights and money. And it wasn't for lack of comprehension. I mean, these aren't really difficult concepts to get your head around. They instantly saw the damage potential and it didn't mesh with their cultural belief systems. And that's, that's very important to recognize. Um, so how do we defeat the cancer of our culture? We starve it of its blood flow and resources. We phase out activities that feed it. We find value in other places. Turn your back on elements of modernity. And I'm not suggesting all at once, overnight, or even a year or whatever. It might take more than your lifetime. But the key is the attitude to stop buying into the mythology, see it for what it is. It's an empty and destructive delusion. And we'll look more at this in the final episode. So what's going to happen? I mean, the optimal outcome would be a gradual kind of winding down, maybe driven by uh, demographic decline and birth rates that economies might somehow transition from growth to contraction, um, you know, uh, mildly um, and uh, willingly, uh, that the, the scale of enterprise just winds down, population density declines, maybe some regions are abandoned, gives the community of life room to breathe and rebound. But more likely, economies are going to thrash in the face of these challenges. There will be efforts to maintain flows of energy and materials and, of course, money, could trigger wars, supply chain disruptions that make COVID look like a picnic, um, you know, could cripple industries and cascading failures. And I think modernity is not likely to cope well, as, especially as, you know, the power players aim to prevent its fall and restore a former glory. So I think that the efforts to keep the wheels in the cart are likely to be futile because we're not dealing with a fantasy world of some conjured reality in our brains um, you know, biophysical and ecological realities are actually in charge here, not notions in our brains, which are a subset of an ecology. Uh, but, you know, the biophysical world tolerated modernity for a while. Um, but, you know, unsustainable things fail. And modernity is not at all conceived on an ecologically sustainable foundation. It almost never crossed our minds to, to try it. So modernity kind of feeds on faith and progress, but it was never a viable dream. It was never ecologically vetted in relation to the com community of life as some regenerative reciprocal actor in evolutionary terms. So to starve it out, we want to refrain from, you know, falling for the promises of utopia, uh, which amount to kind of a detachment from reality. Um, some notion that we can achieve perfection in this artificial fabrication if we just change the nature of the world or or human nature change ecological relationships to suit modernity but you know that's the wrong direction the universe is bigger and it was here first 
Uh, so the community of life of which humans are a part was shaped over eons and is not about to conform to notional half-baked realities of our mental creation. Um, and this brings us to this fundamental flaw, this conceit that the world can somehow fit in our heads. And it's easier if we strip it of ecological context. And to me, that's indicative of this staggering ecological ignorance, including on my part. I'm no you know, ecological guru. I just recognize the importance of it. Um, and we have no choice in the long run but to conform ourselves to the ecological web of life. I mean, nobody has conceived a credible plan for an ecological modernity, and that's not even a thing. Now, when it's clear that a loved one is in terminal condition and there are no more sensible treatments to be called in, we might often call hospice, and the goal here is to make the process of dying as comfortable as it might be, and it's still an emotional uh, and difficult time, and the sense of loss can be overwhelming. Uh, now, Vanessa Andreotti wrote a fantastic book called Hospicing Modernity. It's a great title. I mean, bingo. That's exactly what we need. Um, the idea is rather than dump modernity's body in a ditch, we can show it some respect, give it a dignified passing, allow ourselves to grieve over the losses, which are real, but all while accepting the unavoidable truth of the matter, that modernity is not long for this world, and its continuation threatens the community of life, of which we are an integral and dependent part. Okay, so we're talking about big changes. You know, life won't be the same. This is a big adjustment. And meaning will no longer come from modernity. And that's okay. I mean, modernity is something of an empty sham. It's a patently unsustainable mode of living on this planet whose perks are outweighed by its ills. And, you know, where would we get meaning from in this case? Well, I'll offer this simple guideline or set of guidelines. If it requires non-renewable materials or modern forms of energy or industrial processes or purchase with money, then maybe it's best to treat it as being devoid of meaning. And you might say, well, is there anything left that seems to cover it? Well, yeah, most of the universe, I mean, uh, is outside of that system. So maybe think about relationships between people and animals and plants and rivers and lakes and mountains and weather. Think about things like love and laughter and singing, dancing, awe, health and fitness. All of these are valuable things without money or industrial output being involved. The trappings of modernity kind of displace these more intrinsic appreciations, kind of like a tumor displaces healthy tissue. And think about deathbed reflections. I've mentioned this before that are not, they don't tend to be about material things, but about moments and relationships that either the person had or wish they'd had, um, and that don't cost a thing. And we can prioritize those kinds of very important, meaningful things while minimizing industrial elements. So the prospect of shedding familiar elements of industrial life might seem overwhelming and scary. And that's why I like this quote from Hospicing Modernity. There's a popular saying in Brazil that illustrates this insight using water. The saying goes that in a flood situation, it is only when the water reaches people's hips that it becomes possible for them to swim. Before that, with the water at our ankles or knees, it is only possible to walk or wade. In other words, we might only be able to learn to swim, that is, to exist differently, once we have no other choice. In other words, don't fret too much about the fact that your life, deeply integrated into a sick culture, now requires a car and a house and whatever else. It's not all your fault. You can, though, fall out of love with modernity, maybe even resent the fact that you're trapped in this bad relationship. You can build awareness that modernity chases inappropriate goals. You can yearn for a more sensible, ecologically rooted world. And that attitude shift alone can make you a driving force for this changing world. You just have to stop believing in and propagating mythology. And, you know, that doesn't sound too hard, does it? And I think you can even start today. Okay, that's it for this time. Next time, we're going to try to synthesize the series to date in one go. In the meantime, as always, I encourage you to look at the more polished written version of this episode at the Do The Math blog, dothemath.ucsd.edu, and I'll see you next time.